Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I am so grateful my sister-in-law was gracious because she could have had a lot of fun with that. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate it. And thank you to you as a congregation and to many of you as individuals because over the past you have blessed the ministries and services of Timbercrest with your gifts and your uh, blessings. Um, Timbercrest is, has in its very mission um, that we will not refuse care to anyone who is a resident or needs uh, exceptional care when they are not able to take care of it on their own accord. We do ask that they have Medicare or Medicaid in place, but we subsidize the gap between the cost of care and what their insurance might pay. And to give you an idea of what that entails, last year, Timbercrest uh, allocated over $875,000 for uh, charity care for people who are in residence. So gifts given by Church of the Brethren congregations uh, throughout Indiana um, join in that charitable assistance fund unless they are otherwise de uh, designated and for the generosity of the brethren across this state. We are deeply grateful. So this morning, I'm going to do something a little bit different, and it's Ted and Sue's fault because they said, I don't want to hear a sermon that we've heard before. So this is brand new, and um, I'm going to try something out on you all. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of, of work that is geography, geology, and theology. So hang on. Now the sermon title, and I'm sorry for the rudeness of it, the earth belches fire and smoke but, and ashes, and you know what? That's exactly what it did. This week I made this presentation to the Rotary Club in North Manchester, and they says, maybe you ought to change it to Stan and the Volcano. So I hope you'll bear, bear with me through this. Um, the context needs to be set for this. And so I want you to know that during the years that I worked for the World Council of Churches, I had the privilege of traveling throughout uh, Southeast Asia. And one of my favorite spots soon became the Philippines and the Panoy people. So on December 29th, I set out for a holiday vacation in the Philippines. Um, it wasn't a direct route to get there, but it got me there over time. As you might know, the Philippines are located in Southeast Asia in the western part of the Pacific Ocean. The country is made up of over 7,600 islands. Some of them no bigger than what you can stand on. Some of them hold large, large cities. The country is blessed with all kinds of wonderful things. Beautiful mountains, lush agricultural lands, abundant trade winds to generate electricity, delightful beaches, and the waters of the Pacific Ocean, and I would be remiss if I didn't say also some very simple and delightfully tasty food. 
Friends met me at the airport and we quickly enjoyed a day in Manila recovering from a 30-hour travel um, by airplane. Then off to the beach in Puerto Galera on Mindoro Island. I gotta confess to you that I could grow accustomed to 80 to 85 degree days, walking to the ocean waves and white sands every morning, eating on the beach under a palm tree, finding lounge chairs to comfortably enjoy the morning sun and swimming. After lunch, there was a nap during the afternoon rains, which led to a cool evening. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, guess what? It really was. From there, we took a fast boat transit. And by the way, fast boat means eh, not so fast. I think it's an oxymoron that they want you to think it's fast, but it was like a two-hour trip across the Pacific, back from Mindanao Island, back to Luzon, and up into the mountains at Tagate. There were, it was cooler, only 70 degrees, but the air was dry and sweet. When you looked to the south, you could see the tall volcano, and it was beautiful. Towards the north, Manila. And then Sunday, January 12th. Guess where I was? Well, I was in that one of those condos that you see up there, up on the 19th floor out of 24 floors in Tagate, Philippines. And Tagate was inside the evacuation zone for the tall volcano. We heard the initial blast during our Sunday luncheon. Well, actually, we saw people standing outside and they were all going like this. Did you ever play that game as a kid? Everybody stand and look up and you finally got everyone else to look. Well, we went outside to see what they were looking at and the source of their enchantment was obvious. The tall volcano had erupted, spewing at first a cloud of steam, later ash and molten rock. On our way back from the cafe to our condominium, it hailed baby finger nail sized pellets, hot to the touch, landing on us, even though we were seven miles away from the volcano. And by the road, by the way, the evacuation zone was an area 14 miles radius from the volcano. The road was already jammed with cars going nowhere. Trucks, buses filled with people, and they were sitting. You could tell by their faces that they were concerned and scared. Then that night, because we decided that there was no place to go, we might as well just stay put. At about 1.30 in the morning, the condo, and I remind you, 19 stories up, began to sway and shake. Evacuation from the building occurred not once, not twice, but three times that night, with earthquakes that ranged from 3.2 to 2.3 on the Richter scale. And if that wasn't enough, the earth shook 24 times after, in between each of the earthquakes in aftershocks. By morning, the ground was covered with ash and the streets were virtually empty. Tens of thousands of residents from around the rim of the volcano, every community which we visited on the island, were affected and virtually evacuated. Most of the people were sent to internally displacement camps uh, located across uh, the Luzon Island. That day, we were fortunate enough to find a car for hire, and we took the 90-minute drive throughout brownout conditions to Manila for the duration of the vacation. I shared with my friends on Facebook what was going on, and I chose my words very carefully not to overly alarm them. But I followed up then with words that we were making good decisions to keep us safe. It was a remarkable vacation, but it included event adventure beyond what I had paid for. But here's where it really hit home, folks. It was the responses from friends and acquaintances from around the world, 
in which they shared their prayers and their blessings for safety, travel, and return. You say, well, why does that bother you? Because all of a sudden, the words, may God bless you, took on a, a different challenge. I want to be clear that I appreciated every message of hope that was given to me. And I understand the sincerity in each person's delivery. But I fell into a spiritual quest of trying to understand what is a blessing. You know, they were grateful that I was making progress out of the danger zone to Manila, to an airport after it opened, and eventually home to Fort Wayne. But what about those tens of thousands of people still in the IDP camps in the Philippines? Are you aware that 80% of people in Philippines are Christian? They're devout people. They are faithful to their, to their calling by Christ. How is it that I am blessed because I come back here and no one, not one response was, we pray that God will bless and protect the Philippine people. So you got to hear that my concern comes out of the context of being a white American with a good job, a good credit rating, and credit cards to accomplish anything I needed to do to save my skin. There was an embassy in Manila that I had registered with. It's good to do that when you travel abroad. And they kept me informed during the whole ordeal about where Americans in the disaster zone ought to go for safety and security. You know what? That's a position of power. That's a position of privilege. Just because. So the question is this. What's a blessing? Is it the Old Testament concept that if we follow the law we will be bathed in abundance and a, a, a broadening ability to rule or have authority over? Or is it bound up in the Sermon on the Mount? Can I be blessed when so many others continue to live in peril? Where's the blessing in this disparity? So that's what was going on with me. And it was never about the blessings that people were giving me. I understand what they were trying to say. But my struggle was, is why am I blessed and not the people who live there? Even today, as the volcano continues to sputter and throw ash into the air. Vanitha Rendell Reisner, who is the author of The Scars That Have Shaped Me, Help me through the heavy burden for those remaining in reach of the fire and the ash and my sense of thankfulness. In the midst of the fire and ash, I experienced a blessing from God, a stronger faith, a deeper love, a more intimate walk, or even an understanding of the tenuousness of life itself at that moment. There could have been one of those iconic blasts that in seconds would have taken my life from this earth. They shaped my faith in ways that prosperity and abundance didn't even have a chance to stand up against. While this experience should not be considered as the blessing, it was a channel for a blessing to be realized. Laura Story asks in her song entitled Blessings, what if your blessing comes through raindrops? What if trials in, of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights, the fire and the ash, those are my words, are your mercies in disguise? Well, I am so grateful for people who have studied what it means to receive blessing. Because they helped me in the New Testament scripture that we had read for us. Understand that, first of all, blessing is well defined, right? Material prosperity and perfect circumstances 
were not found in what we read in the blessings that Sue read for us earlier. Quite the contrary. Blessing is typically an outcome of poverty, trial, struggle, challenge, and faith. According to uh, the key word study Bible, which is where I had to go to see what might the Greek word that is translated into blessing bring to this passage. And what it says is, is that a blessing is, has a meaning that we are fully satisfied. So when we're talking about God's blessing tied to the deity of God, it is about being fully satisfied. There are secondary definitions for the word blessing, which is what people were sharing with me. They were sending well wishes. I get that. But what does it mean to receive God's blessing? Well, further research shows that blessing is anything that God gives us to make us more fully satisfied in the presence of God. Think about it. Anything God gives that makes us fully satisfied in God. Anything that draws us closer to God. Anything that helps us relinquish what life on this earth is about and more tightly to the eternal. And often it is the struggles and trials, the aching disappointments, the unfulfilled longings that enable us to move closer to God. In pain, loss, and fright, what do we do? We long for God's presence. We long to know that God is with us and in us and for us. Great families, financial wealth, and good health are all wonderful gifts, and we're grateful for them, but they are not God's blessing from the deity. They make us happy, but they don't make us necessarily happy in God. They don't draw us closer to the divine. God's greatest blessing always rests in God. When we understand and grow close to that, understanding that we, we want to be blessed by God, challenged, gone through struggles, drawn to the heart of God, then, and only then, are we truly blessed. So, was I truly blessed? Well, absolutely. From the fire and the ash, the ground shaking and a mass exodus, I found total peace. I came to the terms that if my life were to end, it was okay. For you see, I was with people whom I loved, and I knew they loved me. I walked and rode with people of profound faith. Together, we were on the journey to safety. Our journey drilled down to the core of my being, the blessing of God that was provided through their accompaniment, their love, and peace of mind and peace of my heart. That was the blessing, and for it, I give thanks each day. To know that my Philippine friends have life today, I am so grateful and thankful. For those who were drivers in the hotels, the airports, the airplanes, all along the way, who gave of themselves to assure our return, our 
return. I am so grateful. Now when I read the Beatitudes from the message, along with the perspective that I've just shared about what a blessing is, that which draws us closer to God, I think that you will join me in a new understanding of those Beatitudes. With them, I am compelled to intentionally follow Jesus with a deeper, deeper commitment and a sense of gratitude. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge clouds, crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed the hill with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and he taught his climbing companions. Here's what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God. Blessed are you when you feel lost, uh, that you feel that you have lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever have in your life. You're blessed when you care. At the moment that you are being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind, your soul, your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourself blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. In fact, give a great cheer, for though they don't like it, I do, and all of heaven applauds you, and know that you're in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. May God's blessing, may God's blessing be with you through the reading of this word, that which draws you closer to the heart of God. Amen. And now, my friends, may we go forth from this place not really needing the fire and the ash to help us realize the true blessing that God has given us, the ability to walk closer and closer to God in our daily lives, for it is with the abundance of that gift that we can live fully present in this age. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.